On the 1st of May, 1873, David Livingstone was found dead, kneeling beside his bed with his face in his hands on the pillow. He was, and had been for a long time, the most famous African missionary worker. As a young man, he'd heard Robert Moffat, a missionary to South Africa, say, I had sometimes seen in the morning sun the smoke of a thousand villages where no missionary had ever been. This image haunted him. God's call grew as Moffat's testimony would not leave his mind. And Livingstone grew in a confidence that the Word of God would do its saving work through him. He wrote, The Word written shall find its own mysterious, tortuous way into every region, dialect, and language of the earth, and men shall be convinced of sin as well as taught their need of a Savior by its life-giving power. It shall whisper peace to the agitated conscience and tell of the love of a Father reconciling the world to Himself by the blood of His Son. And he speaks about Jesus by saying, My great object was to be like him, to imitate him as far as he could be imitated. We have not the power of working miracles, but we can do a little in the way of healing the sick. And I sought medical education in order that I might be like him. David Livingstone became world famous, lost to the world for six years, looking for the source of the Nile. Found by Henry Stanley, uh, the reporter from the United States, and leading to that famous phrase, Dr. Livingstone, I presume. But even his search for the source of the Nile was something which had a greater purpose. It was a stunt to highlight the evils of the slave trade. He wrote, if the good Lord permits me to put a stop to the enormous evils of the inland slave trade, I shall not grudge my hunger and toils. I shall bless his name with all my heart. The Nile sources are valuable to me only as a means of enabling me to open my mouth with power among men. A little over a month after Livingstone's death, the Zanzibar slave market closed forever with pressure from the British government. Queen Victoria announced a success to Parliament and said, Treaties have been concluded with the Sultan of Zanzibar, which provide means for the more effectual repression of the slave trade on the east coast of Africa. Almost a year after his death, on April the 15th, 1874, the body of David Livingstone was brought to England, and there was a national day of mourning. On April the 18th, his funeral was paid for by the British government, and in the sight of huge crowds, his body was laid to rest in Westminster Abbey. His epitaph reads in, in part like this, For thirty years his life was spent in an unwearied effort to evangelize the native races, to explore the undiscovered secrets, to abolish the desolating slave trade, this open sore of the world. The satirical magazine Punch, yes, Punch, muted its satire, put it to one side, to bid farewell to David Livingstone. They wrote, He knew not that the trumpet he had blown out of the darkness of that dismal land had reached and roused an army of its own to strike the chains from the slave's fettered hand. He needs no epitaph to guard a name which men shall prize while worthy work is done. He lived and died for good. Be that his fame. Let marble crumble. This is living stone. His longing was to follow Jesus Christ, the one we re had read about as we read about Zacchaeus, Jesus wasn't afraid of a bit of a stunt to attract attention either. We'll come to that in a little while. But Jesus is passing through. He's moving from one place to another, and he's on his way to Jerusalem. No one but he knows it's his last time through for he's going to Jerusalem to die. And Zacchaeus 
a tax collector hears that he's coming. We don't know much about Zacchaeus, but for the fact that he was a tax collector and he was very wealthy. But we can tell from the writings of the day and the knowledge of, of the culture of the day that he would not have been a popular man. He might have been wealthy, but he was no celebrity, at least not in the way that he would have wanted to be. He would have been very unpopular. He was a collaborator, a cheat, a liar, someone who said, you've got to pay this, when in fact, they owed much less. He was someone who would both be feared and hated by the, the poor people and the rich people who had to pay him the taxes so that they could go to the Romans. And he hears that Jesus is on his way. Now, the Bible tells us that he was a short man, and he, he went up a sycamore tree. He couldn't see over the rest, and he wasn't going to elbow his way through the crowd. Things happen to unpopular people in large crowds. So he decides to go up a sycamore tree. He may not have been the only one up a tree. In fact, it's quite likely there were lots of people around trying to see Jesus, trying to see um, who he was, trying to see what he looked like, maybe trying to catch his words as he walked past. He wouldn't be walking past quickly because there were crowds around, there were lots of people about. And so there he sits, safe in his tree to observe, not getting too close, but you see, he was a rich man. And in the previous chapter of Luke, we hear the story of a, a devout, rich young man who comes to Jesus and asks what it takes to, to find eternal life. And when Jesus tells him to give away all that he has, he turns away sad. And Jesus comes out with that famous phrase, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus comes from that experience, and as he passes through Jericho, there is this rich, powerful man up a tree who is fascinated with Jesus. Why didn't he come and meet him? Why didn't he use what influence he had to try and talk to Jesus? Well, for one, maybe shame. He was a traitor to his people, and here was a religious teacher, a popular religious teacher who was coming through, and someone who seemed to know everything about you. Well, at least that was the rumor. That's what people said when they met him. He knew everything about me. So perhaps he doesn't want to come too close. We can all be a bit like that with God, can't we? We can all be a bit like that um, as we uh, try and find out about him. We won't, don't want to get too close because he does know everything about us, and he might tell other people. There is shame that sometimes keeps us from drawing close to God, and we'd rather stand at a distance or hide in the corner or perhaps, perhaps sit at the very back, in the back row, and just listen in if we do come to church. Perhaps he was worried he'd be recognized by the crowds, and what would people say? if they knew that he was talking to this religious leader? What would people say if they knew you were watching this? Or if uh, they knew that you, maybe you were thinking about going to church? I mean, what would people say? Well, only they know. Perhaps you can guess. Maybe he wasn't ready. Maybe he re wasn't really ready to have a confrontation, but little did he know this was his last chance, the last time he'd get the last time Jesus would pass. And then Jesus stops. The challenge for us as a church and for you and I as, as believers in Christ, if we believe in Him and are saying that we follow Him, when we see someone, when we notice someone who, who wants to know more, who wants to understand more, but perhaps we find them difficult, perhaps we don't like them, perhaps we don't like what they do, do we stop? Well, Jesus did. And then came, if you like, the stunt. Instead of stopping and perhaps maybe teaching there and allowing, allowing uh, Zacchaeus to listen in, um, he looks up into the tree and he says, hello, hello Zacchaeus, <laughs> you've got to come down. I'm going to visit you today. 
I'm going to go to your house and stay there. Oh, what a rule breaker Jesus was. He cut through the religious laws and all the, the laws that, um, that people had added to the law that God had given, um, doing things that the religious leaders found difficult. And this was one of them because he talked to and welcomed someone who was a tax collector, someone who was a traitor to his own nation, someone who was a traitor to his faith, and said to him, I want to come and eat with you, which was the ultimate sign that you accepted someone if you, would, if you were willing to eat with them and to be with them. He broke through all the conventions because he wanted to talk to Zacchaeus. And often God does that, and it can be uncomfortable. Believe me, it can be uncomfortable for the church, and it can be uncomfortable for the people of God, and it can be uncomfortable for those who don't know God but are looking. Jesus often breaks through all the protocol, all the red tape, all the things that would stop us hearing from him and says, come on, I want to talk to you. Perhaps you find that to be your own experience. Perhaps you're finding that to be your own experience. It wasn't always approved of. Uh, the people muttered, the religious people, you know, the good people, the people who think they're better because they go to synagogue or go to church. Foolish people, but they're around all the same. They looked at him and said, and they muttered among themselves, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. How could he do such a thing? We wouldn't. We're, we're too good for that. We wouldn't do it. Even if he invited us, we wouldn't do it. He goes to be the guest of a sinner. But this sinner listens in a way that the, the devout, rich young man of the previous chapter in Luke wasn't willing to listen. This sinner longed to know who this Jesus was. And when Jesus says, I'm coming to your house, he gladly took him. We don't know how long he was there. We don't actually have a record of the conversations that they had. Sometimes we get the sentence, maybe just from reading it, that, that he would only been there a short time when what happens next happens. But, but it may have been quite a while. It may have been a day. It may have been more. He says, I'm going, to, I need, I'm going to stay at your house. He's not talking about a short 10-minute visit to have a look around and see, see what he's done with the place. He's talking about time. Jesus has time for sinners. And so this man who had everything as far as wealth and honor uh, was concerned, well, not among his own people, but among the ruling class, the Romans, as a tax collector. This man invites this strange religious teacher, this preacher, into his house. And as he listens, his life begins to change. And in the middle of a meal, in front of all the people who've come, probably not the, the great and the good, not the religious people, not the people who, you know, would have been seen at the front in synagogue on a Sabbath day, his friends, the ones who are willing to associate with him because he's rich and they don't care about the religious people. In front of all of them, he says, I'm going to give away half of what I've got. And I've, if I've cheated anyone, I'm going to give them back four times the amount. God turned his life around. And what had been most valuable to him, most commanded his most loyalty, was being thrown away, given away. Why? Because he'd met the purpose of life itself. He'd met the one who gives purpose and who gives peace, the one who takes away the shame and the guilt, and the pain. The one who puts in our hearts that thing that we long for, and that we look for, and we try and fill with money, or with relationships, or with fame and celebrity. No, 
he'd met the one who fulfilled all that he needed and all that he needed to know. And so that which he had been collecting and amassing over all those years, perhaps decades, he gives away. What is it that you're obsessed with? What is it that you try and fill your life with? What is it that, that, that you use to try and bring happiness to yourself? Does it work as well as the case with his money? It probably does, not very well at all. Oh, it works for a while. We all need the basic necessities of life, and it's easy to talk about not needing money when we don't have a lot, but actually, often it's those who have a lot who are more obsessed with money. And as Jesus said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven because he won't let go of what he's obsessed with or she's obsessed with. But Zacchaeus let go. And he let go in the most public and spectacular way because he stood up and he told everyone, I'm done, I'm finished with all this. Life is to be found somewhere else. And so it is, whatever you've been chasing that is not satisfied, you give it up. Give it up and find real life in Jesus. For that's what Jesus says. He is the rule breaker, but he's also the one who proclaims what has happened here. He says, today salvation has come to this house. Today. Why? Because Zacchaeus was willing to walk away from those things that seemed so precious to him and was willing to put his life into God's hands and into the hands of the one who was actually quite literally on his way to die for his sin and for the sins of the world. Zacchaeus found salvation. Now, salvation brings many things, but, but one of the things it brings is a taking away of guilt and shame. That guilt and shame that comes to us in the dark moments of our lives or in the dark hours of the morning. When we think about what we've done and what we've said and what we've thought, when we think about our lives, when we think about those times when we find life most difficult and we knew it was our fault, when we think about the things we've said to those we've loved, and perhaps it has done irreparable harm to the relationship we once had with them. And if we could do anything, we'd try and bring it back, but we try and fill our lives with things instead. Well, Jesus says about Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to, to this house, and today salvation can come to your house. If you're willing to put your trust in the one who made heaven and earth, but who also, in an amazing, unthinkable way, came and lived among us as one of us and died in our place, taking the punishment for our sin, taking upon himself the shame and the guilt that was due to us. He says, salvation has come to this house. Oh, boy, what a wonderful thing to say. He says, this man is truly a son of Abraham. Oh, God had promised Abraham in the Old Testament that he would make a people out of him and that, that, that many would be in God's kingdom because of him. The Scriptures tell us, the Old Testament tells us that God credited righteousness to, to Abraham because of his faith, because of his trust in God. And Jesus says, this tax collector, this, this traitor, this one that you all look down on, this one that you think nothing of, this one that you think you're better than, this man is a true son of Abraham. And so it is for all who put their trust in Christ. The church is made of broken people, mended by God of people who know the reality of who they are and of what they've done, but have found that God accepts them anyway 
and you and I and anyone else who puts their trust in Christ, who doesn't try to do our best to please God, but accepts what God has done for us as a free gift, we too are sons and daughters of Abraham. And then he says one of the most wonderful things I think he's ever said, and he said it a few times in the Gospels. He says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't come for the religious people. They think they're good enough and maybe they'll find out that they're not and turn from, from that and maybe they won't, but he came to seek and to save the lost. For the lost know they're lost. The poor know they're poor. The lonely know they're lonely. Those who have failed and know they've failed are the ones that God has sent Jesus to. The ones who are willing to say, I, I can't do anything. I'm a failure. And find that God reaches out a hand and says, well, you failed this time, but come on, back on your feet. Come and walk with me and learn from me. Find forgiveness. Find peace in your trouble. Find covering for your shame as you walk with me. We don't know if Zacchaeus went with Jesus to Jerusalem, but he will have heard of all that happened there. But he'd promised to follow. He promised to give away that thing that had consumed him and destroyed his life. And that call comes to you and to me today. Are you willing to admit that you're lost? Are you willing to admit that you don't know everything? Are you willing to admit that actually, you know what, there is someone who made heaven and earth who knows better than you do and certainly knows better than I? For if you are, Jesus is willing to proclaim over you, today salvation has come to this house. You are a true son. You are a true daughter of Abraham, and you are one of his. Not because of what you will do for him in the future. Forget about that. But because of what he has done for you and for me in the past. If you already belong to him, be reminded of what you were and of what he has done. And what he did for you then, he will continue to do now. God will finish the work in you that he has begun, just as the New Testament promises. So, are you looking? Well, be warned. You get too close. You'll find God, as it were, looking up the tree at you, going, come on, we need to talk. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For when you hear from him and know from him how much he loves you in spite of all that you think and of all that you've done and all that you've said, there is nothing more wonderful in the world. And you will find yourself wanting to leave behind those things that have fascinated you and that have filled your life for the sake of knowing him. Oh, to hear God say of you, and to be reminded, perhaps if we belong to him, salvation has come to this house. May that be your experience today. Amen.